Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Software as a service, or SaaS, is a way of delivering applications over the internet as a service. Instead of installing and maintaining software, you simply access it via the internet, freeing yourself from complex software and hardware management. SaaS applications are sometimes called web-based software, on-demand software, or hosted software. Whatever the name, SaaS applications run on SaaS providers' servers. The provider manages access to the application, including security, availability, and performance. Many of us use these applications daily. Today, I speak to an expert in this area. Nathan Gampel is the CEO of Simpel & Associates, who are known as business transformation specialists. And for more than two decades, Nathan has advised leading organizations on the most complex change programs. This could be anything from private equity-led mergers and acquisitions to modernizing how global organizations work. Nathan helps these companies win at change. He's also the inventor of Kinetic Transformation, a patent-pending algorithm for understanding change at scale and creating action that beat the 70% challenge. So anyone who wants to understand the world of SaaS and so much more, this is your episode. And I warmly welcome Nathan to the politics of everything. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amber. And thank you for having me. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since 2017, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one web-based solution to make the process quick and painless, the way podcasting should be. If you know me, I'm pretty obsessed with quality guests, quality content, and quality sound, and that's what Zencaster allows me to do. Not to mention, it's really easy to use, even for my guests that aren't particularly tech savvy. There's nothing to download, they just click on the link and we start recording. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy, and with everything from local recording to automatic post production all in the one tool, you don't have to leave your browser to get each episode done. I want you to have the same great experience that I do for all my podcasts and content needs. So I have a special offer for you. If you go to zen.ai forward slash politics of everything and enter this promo code, you'll get 30% off in your first three months when you sign up to Zencaster Pro. That's Z-E-N dot A-I, politics of everything. It's now time to share your story. I always love to start off by asking my guests what they wanted to be when they were kids and, you know, in some ways is there, can we join the dots from what you thought you might be as a, as a kid or a teenager to where you are now? Is there a bit of a career trajectory that you can kind of take us on? <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. So I'll share with you, I guess, a little story that, you know, folks who know me know, know very well. So what I wanted to be when I was younger was actually an artist. And it sounds funny for someone who is a corporate consultant, but back when I was a kid or in my younger years, I I, I was very into self-expression being and and, and really being creative and allowing that creativity to flow. And when I told my parents who were both, um, who are both um, still actually working professionals that I wanted to be an artist, you know, they both sighed and said, oh, come on, get real is, you know, that's not, that's not really going to happen. <laughs> You're not going to have make any money. Was that maybe their thought? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, kind of like, hey, you know, maybe you could try this doctor or this accountant thing. It probably will work out better. But, um, but yeah, you know, you know, I, I, I really wanted to be an artist and it's funny, but over the course of my career, even though I started out in banking and, and ended up at big four consulting, I I actually did end up living my dream and becoming an artist. I'm a business consultant, which in a way allows me to be an artist because, you know, every project I go into and every client that I work with, I always have to understand, I have to blend in and I always have to play that role. And so, you know, even though I'm an organization psychologist working in a professional setting, I still feel like I'm, I'm living out my dream of being an artist, being creative and really fitting in and uh, trying to 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 work within uh, strange and fast moving environments, playing a role to help the team and and helping uh, companies win. 
Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm glad to see that all kind of worked out for you. So getting into our topic today, SaaS platforms obviously involve software that's available via third party over the internet. And some household name examples might be, you know, Google Workspace, which I use, Salesforce, Big Commerce. There's a whole stream of them, if you like. These are now really popular. They're the main way that we kind of get our software. I remember, I'm old enough to remember when when that wasn't the case, I think I might have bought some discs, some CDs and actually uploaded software from that a number of years ago and that sort of was the norm if you like. Do you remember or can you explain to us how this kind of SaaS platform kind of started and evolved and really for all of us it's it's generally what we do every day and we might not even realise we're using it? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, What's funny about that? Well, first of all, you know, I'm I'm also old enough to remember when, <laughs> when it all started. But um, you know, if I had to sum it up in in one word, kind of what's happened and how we got there, the word I'd probably use is Lego. Mm. So what I mean by that is when you know a number of years ago when we were starting out and you know you had a program that would be installed on premises and you had to work with. Oftentimes, you know, kind of like cable TV, you would get a whole package of features, a whole package of channels, if you will. And really, you only use this little piece or that little piece. And so what happened was, you know, these big programs were resident and were part of work when really you only might have needed a specific piece. And so this demand for flexibility or this demand to really build your own solution, at least to me, like Lego is really how SaaS got started, or at least got started um, in, and, and took off as quickly as it did. And technically, it was also, you know, kind of the growth and advent of the API as part of that. And so, you know, instead of having these big hulking platforms or these big hulk, hulking uh, uh, programs, now you could really select what you want. You don't have to have it installed on site. It can be on the cloud. And you can really piece things together that you want especially, you know, with with kind of the growth and the improvement of APIs and other integration technologies. So again, to me, it was really about that desire to build the model or build the solution as you want it with the pieces that you want. And as the technology grew and as technology became a lot more specific and functionalized, if you will, as a SaaS, you know, that's what really took off. And, you know, as it started, it was no secret that it was going to grow because, again, it just satisfied that desire to really customize and get what you want when you want it and where you want it. Is there a company or platform that really is the kind of hero or the starting point of SaaS? Is there a particular household name which, you know, might sort of in some ways people go, oh, I remember the first time I bought that, uh, you know, online and that was that was my first entree into SaaS. Is there something or a particular company that stands out for you in that way? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, it's kind of like saying, what's your favorite album, music album of all time, <laughs> you know, it's, child or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like, it's like so hard to pick one. But I think off the top of my head, if I had to pick one that really is standing out these days, it's Salesforce, um, yeah. or the Salesforce CRM. And, and the reason is, you know, particularly here in the States, you know, Salesforce has, you know, really been shown to be not only a fast growing company, but also a resilient company, even in the face of a lot of challenge. And it's always funny to me, you know, it's so widely held as an investment. And when I speak to people who may not be as knowledgeable about a SaaS and what SaaS is, and I ask them, you know, what Salesforce is, so to speak, they don't really understand. They know it has something to do with sales, but they don't really understand what it means. And, and, and I think that's what makes SaaS so interesting. It's kind of like what you said at the start. People, I think, who may be uninitiated or less aware or less familiar, they may take for granted the fact that you can just pop open a phone, access a program and all of your data on the cloud wherever you are at any given point. And I think Salesforce was really a, it is really a revolutionary product because, you know, I think once people really understand what it is and how it took activities, you know, let's say that 20, 30 years ago, we all took for granted and turned it into a system or turned it into a solution that we can access and gives us data and gives us rich data. You know, I think if people actually take the time to think about it, it's programs and solutions like that where, you know, really the SaaS has become the job and the job can't be separated from the SaaS anymore. And although I don't think there's one solution that jumps out, I think it's solutions like Salesforce that have really grown up and redefined what it is to, let's say, in the modern world, be a salesperson or manage sales operations. I think when folks kind of start to understand it that way and say, wait, 20 years ago, 
you know, a good salesperson was someone who followed up and did this stuff. And today we take it for granted that all that's in Salesforce. And so I think when people stop to think about it and realize maybe what the job is today versus what it was 20 years ago, programs like that or SaaS programs like that, you know, it really is remarkable how much, how quickly that they've grown, how quickly they've infiltrated, but also how quickly we've grown to take it for granted that they've, they've really changed our lives in so many ways. Absolutely. So cloud computing and SaaS have come a long way as we, we've been discussing in this show so far. Increased awareness and uptake has accelerated the growth of SaaS products and led to the rise of, say, SaaS integration platforms such as infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Companies will continue to outsource some of their non-core IT activities to specialist service providers sometimes who can just do it better. And particularly if they're a big organization, they'll have the resources to do that. So the cloud approach in some ways can help all of us um, at different levels of business, whether you're sort of a startup through to, you know, your big four consulting to every other sort of business out there. I guess my question is, and you may not be a cyber risk ex- expert, but mm-hmm. I have thought about this before, that security risks that you kind of naturally open yourself up to because you're in this cloud world all of a sudden. You know, we, we, we talk about privacy and social media, for example, and our security and what we share. and But really, you're giving away a lot of data if you're kind of, you know, your entire sales platform, for example, and your channels are being managed by an external company. Is there something that we need to sort of think about and be aware of, or are there checks and balances that these companies have to go through to allow them to provide that for us? Yeah, absolutely. So so that is that is definitely a complicated question. So I'm I'm gonna try and break it down into three parts. I think I think the first thing is, you know, kind of the general answer, which is yes. So there are people who are definitely much better and much more versed in cybersecurity than me. But what I will say as somebody who works with a lot of SaaS platforms, does a lot of SaaS integration and a lot of SaaS solutions, what I would say is that cybersecurity is clearly something that's on everyone's mind, especially, you know, I do a lot of work with financial services organizations like banks, insurance companies, and and also on the pharma side or, or on the healthcare side as well. And so, you know, there is definitely increased awareness, I would say, around cybersecurity. And what I would say is that as that increased awareness is growing and as the models become more complex or evolve, the cybersecurity needs are definitely changing. So what I would say is it's interesting. Cybersecurity is always something that folks are aware of, but as the solutions become more and more complicated, the need to develop customized solutions for cybersecurity in particular that take into account all the interconnections, all the different programs, all the different platforms, you know, obviously that's a that's a primary concern and, and it's driving a lot of influence and a lot of change right now in the market. Some of that change is good. Some of that change is, is, is not so good. And those are kind of the two other points I would make. Yeah. I would say to go a little bit deeper, the change that is good is you know, the more and more that these models become ubiquitous or, or become more common, the more that you'll find more generalist solutions, right? You know, because folks are, you know, let's say connecting a CRM to a marketing platform, to a work automation platform. And so as those integrations become more and more common, you know, naturally you're able to standardize and, and, get, some, and get some more scale, even if you have a very specific model. But at the same time, just like with anything with regulation or anything where it comes to security and kind of preventive measures, there's that tough balance between are you being so preventative that you're stifling innovation and how do you enable innovation to live with the regulation and with the prohibit and, and with the prohibitions and with the security and all the things that hold you back, but also hold you back for good reason. So I think it's, it's, it's a complicated question. And a lot of it has to do with the specificity of the model. As you get standardization, as it becomes similar, that will grow. But then at the same time, that balance of cost benefit is something that is, is, is pertinent. And obviously, depending on the industry, like banking will be different than let's say retail, right? All, all records are obviously precious and, and all data obviously needs to be protected with the highest degree of certainty. But there are also certain specific, you know, needs that have to be accounted for that go above and beyond. And so I think as time goes on and as people become more comfortable with these models, it's going to continue to be an issue and continue to push the industry to think differently and find opportunities. So the, what role does SaaS play in business transformation? Because I know that's one of your sweet spots and how, and perhaps do you have an example which some of us maybe might be able to relate to? Because I always think if you can picture something because it's explained with a real life example, that can help some of us non-technical people understand this a little bit better. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so, you know, it, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question, right? Because whenever, you know, I talk, so I do specialize in transformation and I specialize in, in, in what's referred to as work automation or the idea of how do you digitize work so that you can simplify or even automate the stuff that doesn't add value so that people can focus more on the stuff that does. And so, you know, one of the examples that I've been giving uh, um, recently to folks is the example of a swimming pool. And so, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a swimming pool. My wife wanted one and it was like a lifelong dream. And so a few years ago, we decided to get a home with a swimming pool. And, and as a boy from the Bronx, you know, learning a swimming pool was extremely complicated for me. And the first year I, I broke the filter. The second year I did something <laughs> else wrong. But by the third year, you know, I started to understand how the pool worked. And what I realized was all the pool is, is a giant biochemistry and physics experiment, right? It's physics because the motor is pulling water and cycling it back. And the biochemistry is, is the chemicals that you add to, let's say, prevent algae from growing and to keep the water clean and fresh. And that's kind of how I like to think about, you know, let's say a SaaS solution, especially in transformation. Oftentimes, there are activities that we all do that we take for granted, whether it's filtering a swimming pool, sometimes it's project management, sometimes it's being in accounts payable and, you know, or an accounts receivable and processing that purchase order. But Every day, all of us do work and work can be thought of generally as kind of two things. There's the stuff that's repeatable and the stuff that is standardizable, kind of like the swimming pool example of pulling in the, you know, the water through the filter. And then there's the biochemistry part, which is really highly specialized, requires a lot of testing and, and kind of getting it right. And if you break down work that way between, you know, the stuff that's really esoteric and knowledge related versus the stuff that's kind of predictable and repeatable, that's really where SaaS in my mind from transformation becomes very powerful. It's not about trying to digitize everything, transform everything. It's about looking for the opportunities. And this is the key word where it enhances what you do, yes. right? Which is why the word outsourcing always has such a bad connotation because we're taking something and giving it to someone. No, no, no. We're enhancing how the business does something. We're looking for opportunities to enhance so that we free up capacity so that we could spend more time on the biochemistry because I'd rather spend more time swimming and less time worrying about things like a filter, which is handled by an engine anyways. Yeah. And that's how I like to think about SaaS and transformation. It's finding, understanding work, breaking it down into the stuff that requires the expertise, the stuff that can be, let's say, automated. And then really going at that automation in a way that it is not an outcome, but rather a feature of the process. So it enhances what we do every day. That's, I think you've explained that very clearly. So thank you. It's a very complicated question, I know. Look, the sector is starting to mature, consolidate and harmonize like a lot of different sectors do over time. Recently, we saw a buyout of the Apollo program by Stagwell, for example. Is lack of competition a risk for SaaS products or is that not the case? What's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, so it, it really depends how you look at SaaS product, right? Because SaaS product can be extremely, it can be a, an extremely broad field, right? So from a competition perspective, of course, right? Let's say CRM, we, we spoke about Salesforce, but, you know, even though Salesforce might be the biggest, it's not the only game in town. You have HubSpot, you have so many other products that are out there. And the challenge, you know, going back to the example before about, transformation is, and, and I think you see this a lot, and it really does influence competition, is the notion that people sometimes try and push the solution, as opposed to it being a feature of a process that enhances the process, the solution sometimes becomes the problem. And I think that's where the competition oftentimes comes in, because there's certainly no shortage of products. Like if any area becomes generally accepted, like CRM or marketing automation or whatever, you know, there's going to be no shortage of companies that are going to flood the space because if the market is validated, you know, to create a, you know, some level of automation, oftentimes, you know, it's not that hard. Like you saw this, for instance, in marketing over the last several years, I think I saw a picture somewhere that there were something like thousands of marketing automation tools, right? Yes. It can't be that all of them are going to survive and, and all of them are satisfying a different need, right? There's probably a lot of overlap. And so for me, I think, 
competition is of course something and i think it's something big i think what's going to define competition is going to be two things number one making sure that your that the solution doesn't become the problem right so as more competition and shiny new objects come not running to the shiny object because that might create more of a problem but number two and this is perhaps to me the more interesting idea is SAS is a concept which really anyone can do. Anyone can create their own SaaS product if they want to digitally enhance what they're doing. It's just a matter of, like I said, using the right process. And that's a big part of what I do every day. You know, when I help two companies merge or, you know, I run a hundred million dollar transformation of a global organization, right? I'm not trying to solve world hunger. What I'm trying to do is help a client get from point A to point B in the best possible way. And that best possible way can oftentimes involve digital enhancement. And so that's the interesting thing about SaaS is that it feels like it's a high barrier to entry, but it's actually not. And you know, if you do it the right way and you understand how digital transformation works the right way, oftentimes clients will buy you know, comp- you know, a, a, the, ni- the, the shiny new thing, but then they'll build a lot of technology around it to enhance it. And that's what makes SaaS so cool. And like Lego is you can build SaaS, you can build product, you can build custom products. The technology is so friendly that it makes it easy as long as you understand what it's doing and how to make it a feature rather than an outcome, you can build your own SaaS products and forget competition, rather give yourself enough of an enhancement that you're able to leapfrog and really find the solution that works for you. And that's what I love so much about SaaS solutions. So this is probably a natural next question. So what kind of products and innovations do you see happening in the next few years with SaaS? A bit of a crystal ball, if you like. And and who will they really benefit? What are you seeing in this space at the moment? Yeah, so I, I think I think what you're going to start seeing a lot, and I think you're already seeing it, it's kind of like at the birth of AI. Well, AI has been around for like 50, 60 years, but in the last five to 10 years, there's been a massive resurgence of, let's say, artificial intelligence. And, you know, without going too much or too far into a tangent, you know, one of the, the criticisms of AI has always been, you know, AI gets better and better, but it's really not thinking. It's not a computer that's, you know, creative and thinking. It's rather it's getting better at finding patterns and, and finding data. And so a lot of folks attempted to create programs, and I, I worked with some early startups like this, to make AI more accessible and more drop and play, kind of like early days of Microsoft Windows, where you create almost like a GUI or a graphic user interface that makes it approachable. So like with AI, making AI driven process flows, but doing it almost with like plug and play or drop and load makes it more accessible, makes it more ubiquitous and makes it more usable. So I don't think that AI has taken off to that degree, but to answer your question, that's kind of what I see happening with SaaS, um, in my opinion, Mm. as the tools become easier and easier. And, you know, we can go really deep on the tech, but there are so many tools out there that make it so user friendly, you know, compared to only 10 years ago, almost anyone can kind of watch a YouTube video these days with a couple of bucks or even free in some cases, find the tools that you need and create a solution that works for you. And, you know, to illustrate it, I created my own SaaS product, which the patent pending product you mentioned earlier, and it was really the same idea. It was an idea, it was a theory, it was an algorithm. And then there were so many tools available. And because I understood how to look at work and how to drive that process to turn it into a SaaS solution, that barrier to entry has become a lot lower. And so to me, that's what I really see as the big changes. It's less, you know, it's kind of that Lego example as people become more and more comfortable with SaaS, as protocols around data security, as understanding how these different architectures work and how flexible they are, it just becomes so much more accessible to the layperson. Maybe not the layperson, maybe we're a bit away from that, but it becomes more accessible to, let's say, that medium term user. And I think what you're starting to see, and I see it, in fact, today I saw it with two of my clients, with two separate clients, both of them started creating the basis for solutions you know, stringing together, let's say this data reporting, this database, stringing it together. And they almost created their, you know, they're almost creating their own SaaS solutions, which are customized for themselves. So to me, that's kind of what I see is as SaaS as an idea, as this idea or this notion of digitizing to enhance 
continues to gain acceptance, as people continue to develop their understanding, and as the tools continue to get better, I think it's just going to become more accessible. And again, it's good because if you view it as an enhancement, then it doesn't take my job. Rather, it helps me do my job better, and it helps me deliver better outcomes for shareholders, clients, customers, colleagues, and the like. And again, you know, that's a really good thing. Changing approach a little bit, who have been your sort of number one or two career or life mentors and why? Would you like to give them a bit of a plug while we're having this conversation? I'm always a believer (laughs) that people don't get to where they are without having some fabulous people who support them and maybe inspire them along the way. I mean, who would be your one or two that would really stand out for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So unfortunately, I'm probably not the most exciting. You know, I'm sure everyone gives an example like uh, Elon Elon Musk or whatever. And while some of those people are certainly inspiring, the people that have inspired me most most are actually my family, my dad and my wife. I I write about it a bit in my book, but like my wife taught me, she's not a businesswoman by any stretch. She's a registered dietitian. She's a medical nutrition therapist. And so she's, she couldn't be in a more different field than let's say me, but she taught me some basic ideas, you know, over the course of our 20 plus relationship, she taught me basic ideas about people and about how people interact and the importance of relationships. And I got to tell you, no matter how digitized we get, no matter how complicated life gets, the reality is basic lessons like treat people well, you know, if, if something's confusing, don't just shoot an email out of anger, pick up the phone. It's a good thing to maintain personal connections. You know, just basic ideas about how to treat people in life, whether it's in business or in personal. I I really learned a lot from my wife. And, you know, I do give her a lot of credit because it it was really that influence that helped me develop EQ. And I got my second master's in organization psychology and started working in the field of consulting. Even if I got more technical on the finance side or the technology side or the whatever side, those basic principles of relationships have always stuck with me and have always made a difference. And, you know, as far as my dad goes, since you did ask for two, my dad always taught me to never quit and, and to never, to never give up, to be persistent. And it's never over when it's over and probably killed me for saying this, but you know, my dad had a heart problem for, for a number of years and, you know, he had a heart scare a little while ago and I was so sad and I called him and I was like depressed and he goes to me, Hey, uh, Nathan, you know, you're in the tech space, you know, anyone who's working on artificial hearts or anything. (laughs) And I started laughing because I'm like, look at this guy, you know, he just had a heart event. And this guy's not only is he still fighting, he's going to rack his brain and find the most creative way around things. And, you know, I think it's a great lesson. Be persistent. If you're, if you're focused on something that's good and you believe in it, be persistent, never stop challenging yourself and never give up because you're your own best advocate. And if you give up, then it's over. But if you're always fighting, you've always got a chance. And those lessons with relationships and kind of persistence have really stuck with me and I think really influenced me in my career. As we wrap up our conversation today, would you have a final takeaway message for us on the world of SaaS? What would you like the audience to kind of walk away remembering most about our conversation today? What I would say is always remember to make sure that SaaS is an enhancement. So I know I said it a few times, but the idea is you see this a lot again, where someone says, okay, we have a deficiency in marketing, so we need a solution. Sometimes the solution is is actually worse, right? The solution can actually create problems, right? Sometimes it's a, like I've been explaining, you don't need a, a full product. Maybe what you need is just a process automation and the solution is something you can do yourself or do more simple. And frankly, that alone could save you millions and frankly, at scale, even billions. And so that, that would be my, probably my, my biggest piece of advice for the world of SaaS is don't let the solution become the problem. Figure out what you want, figure out what, why you want it, figure out what you're trying to accomplish. And then just like all things, keep it simple, right? Figure out what you want, why you want it, go for it, you know, test and learn, and make sure that as you roll these things out or, or as you build these things, Make sure that you're not running for the shiny new thing because the reality is it may look good now, but believe me, six months from now, when you're trying to implement that big new system and get everyone to buy into it, believe me, you'll regret not keeping it simple. Fantastic. Um, It's been such a fantastic conversation. We've covered a lot in our time together. And if you do want to connect further with Nathan, there will be some details on the show notes. Until next time, take care. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, 
Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea, you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.